I'm meteorologist Peter Chan coming to you from the National Weather Service on behalf of a unique partnership with Alaska Public Media. This is the Alaska Weather Show. Welcome aboard. It is Tuesday, September 6, 2022, and let's get right into things. A lot to talk about. First of all, weather.gov, that is the National Weather Service's uh, online presence. You can go and it will bring you to this uh, point and click interactive map. Look at the western U.S. this afternoon. We have extensive excessive heat warnings heat advisories red flag warnings for critical fire weather conditions especially there through the pacific northwest washington oregon idaho into montana uh, we have a heat wave now going on across much of california into southern nevada with uh, triple digit heat exceeding 110 degrees in the shade well, here in Alaska, the flood advisory continues on the Kenai River for a glacial, uh, glacier dammed lake outburst coming down the Snow River into Kenai Lake and then affecting now the upper portions of the Kenai to Ski Lack Lake. I'll have more on that in just a moment. Heavy rains are on the way here for uh, later Wednesday night through Thursday and Friday. That'll affect Prince William Sound. Another atmospheric river is going to take aim there along the western into the northern uh, Gulf Coast. Also expect some gusty winds as the pressure gradient tightens up along and just north of the Alaska range here uh, in the same time frame uh, later Wednesday night uh, through early there on Friday. Overall, just a continued wet pattern, especially southwest and south central areas of the state. No real big uh, pattern change coming up. No big warm ups, no big cool downs either. Let's look at a couple of the FAA webcams and uh, as of uh, two o'clock or so this afternoon, Akiak uh, there on the south end of the Kodiak Island overcast skies. The rains will be redeveloping there shortly. Uh, meanwhile, as we go further northeast, Cordova, which is going to get in on heavier rain as we head into uh, especially Thursday and Friday, uh, enjoying sunshine. I hope you had a chance to get out and enjoy that sunshine here today with temperatures in the mid 50s to near 60 degrees. Uh, as far as any uh, hazardous uh, warnings, advisories, or watches we have, the flood advisory on the Kenai River, again uh, from uh, Kenai Lake down through the upper river to Skelac Lake, where we have minor uh, flooding being reported and occurring there. And to the north, I just made a note, those are the special weather statement for uh, the gusty winds that are expected to develop. You can see some wind gusts 50 to 60 miles an hour as the pressure gradient tightens up there along and just north of the Alaska Range to around Fairbanks as we go through late Wednesday night, Thursday into early Friday morning. So I happened to be on the Kenai River uh, yesterday on uh, Labor Day and the river is raging. It is high, it is up uh, at Bankful and beyond in areas, uh, some lowland flooding occurring. Uh, hazardous waiting, uh, be exceptionally careful, wear personal flotation advice if you're going to be on any of the rivers that are high because of rainfall. It doesn't matter whether you're down there in the Kenai, there's other places where uh, many of the coastal rivers are running high along the Gulf Coast where there has been heavier rainfall. So the result of that uh, glacier dammed lake release we can see it's reached its peak now there in the upper river. This is the uh, river gauge uh, for the Kenai River at Cooper Landing. It's hit about 13.8 feet that places it well into minor flood stage. And it's peaking right now. It'll begin to come down uh, as we go through tonight and tomorrow with that flood wave working its way down the river system. So uh, at least the upper river is gonna be in minor flood stage here, uh, likely uh, at least into early Thursday if not a little beyond that, and then uh, further downstream, not anticipating quite the impact, but the Kenai River is gonna stay high uh, for the coming days and probably uh, much of this month, given just the overall pattern we're in. Another quick reminder, Southeast Alaska weather zone realignment coming up uh, September 13th. This only affects uh, products coming out of the Juneau forecast office 
It affects public and fire weather, but no marine zone. This is largely transparent. It's just gonna use borough and census boundary information to help eliminate uh, overwarning of National Weather Service alerts across Southeast Alaska. If you have any questions, concerns, you can uh, contact juno.weather at noaa.gov. And looking at the satellite imagery, well, we have a low still impacting the panhandle, bringing showers there and some gustier winds to the southern panhandle. Back to the west, we can see the broad area of cloudiness south of the Aleutians. That's the one low. There's another low up toward the north central bearing. Those two systems are going to kind of unite in a way. The one to the north is going to help pull that moisture back up toward the north and northwest across the Alaska Peninsula as additional moisture streams northeastward up in, along the western and northern Gulf as we go through midweek. So uh, as we go through today and tonight, the low uh, south of the eastern Aleutians is going to begin to develop uh, northward and then it's going to be pulled back toward the northwest. We still expect some uh, pockets of fog across the interior overnight early on Wednesday morning. The low over the southern panhandle beginning to weaken. And then Wednesday afternoon, there's the primary low taking shape there in the central uh, Alaska Peninsula. It's going to be lifting back toward the north-northwest with a warm front and surge of moisture, that atmospheric river working its way northeastward and then taking aim on Prince William Sound, Cordova, Whittier for Thursday and Friday, five to seven inches of rain on the way there. More rain for Anchorage Bowl as well in the Susitna Valley. Expect high river levels there as additional. Some heavier rains, not quite that heavy, but certainly heavier rainfall long and south of the Alaska Range as we go through midweek. Low temperatures Wednesday morning, uh, upper 40s near 50 Panhandle, upper 40s across much of the coastal areas of the south. And Wednesday afternoon highs, still some lower 60s southern panhandle, but uh, beneath the clouds and uh, developing rain, temperatures mainly in the 50s. And then for Thursday morning, we expect lows upper 40s to lower 50s in the panhandle. Pretty much the same coastal areas. Uh, Kodiak gone up toward Homer, lower mid 50s. However, uh, upper 40s near 50 around the Anchorage Bowl and temperatures Thursday, much of the region generally in the 50s, though the southern panhandle, Ketchikan, Cray, could be up uh, in the lower 60s. Across the far north, uh, 40s common, 30s uh, north slope on Arctic coast, generally still near above freezing. Uh, and uh, then looking for Wednesday afternoon highs, generally in the 50s uh, there across the Yukon Valley. Uh, otherwise, 40s there back up toward along the, the uh, Arctic coast. And then Thursday morning lows, Generally, just above freezing along the Arctic coast, few areas down around or just below freezing uh, in through uh, the eastern portion of the Brooks Range, 40s common, Seward Peninsula, and on over down toward areas of the Yukon River. And temperatures Thursday afternoon are going to get back up uh, into the 50s along the mid upper Yukon uh, River, maybe nearing 60 for Yukon and Fairbanks. And then as we uh, go into the southwest interior, 40s for Wednesday morning uh, and extending out there across the, the Alaska Peninsula. 50s, generally the rule, very common just with the cloud cover, coastal areas, upper 40s, Nunavik Island toward uh, St. Lawrence. And then uh, Thursday morning lows generally in the 40s, uh, again across much of the region, southwest interior, extending through the Aleutians. Thursday afternoon highs will be confined generally lower mid 50s with cloud cover, scattered showers, and areas of rain. A quick check of the six to 10 day temperature outlook September 12th through the 16th. Uh, look for above normal temperatures. Yukon Valley northward through the north slope. A uh, little above normal, maybe south central, otherwise near normal uh, in the southeast and along uh, the southwest. And precipitation overall is expected to average above normal, especially southwest and south central areas, a little below normal in the southern panhandle. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. It's now time to take a look at your aviation weather. If you have a flight plan this midweek, Wednesday, or on Thursday, main weather feature will be uh, area of low pressure, mid upper levels of the atmosphere, as well as at the surface uh, in the vicinity of uh, St. Matthew. But there's going to be a piece of energy, another low coming up along the North Pacific, south of the Aleutian chain, and then riding northeastward up along the North Pacific uh, and western Gulf side uh, of 
the uh, Alaska Peninsula before that pulls back across Bristol Bay and uh, as well as Kuskokwim Bay uh, on Thursday. This is going to send a surge of moisture and atmospheric river up along uh, the North Pacific into the Western Gulf taking aim especially along the Eastern Kenai up into Prince William Sound and Cordova areas. The mountains uh, surrounding the north side of Prince William Sound and around Cordova uh, especially later this week could see as much as six to ten inches of rain with this system very very wet meanwhile widespread IFR conditions uh, bearing straight southward along the southwest coast Wednesday morning areas of the Kenai even up along uh, areas of the the Alaska range especially on the south side of the Alaska range uh, from Windy Pass southward through the uh, Susitna Valley Wednesday afternoon, uh, IFR conditions persist mainly out over the Gulf and then back uh, out toward the, the Alaska Peninsula coming up into the south side of Kodiak Island along areas of the eastern Bering. And then Thursday morning, uh, we start to see uh, the IFR conditions become widespread there in the Gulf along the northern Gulf Coast uh, back through Kodiak Island and along the southwest coast uh, as that system uh, really impacts areas there, especially of the western and northern gulfs here for the end of the week. Thursday afternoon, widespread IFR conditions are anticipated there along areas of the gulf, uh, north central and northeastern areas, uh, western gulf, and then back toward uh, areas of the southwest coast, the uh, YK deltas. And Wednesday, pass conditions, Anatovic Pass uh, should generally see MVFR conditions, as will Attigan Pass. Further south and west, Lake Clark and Merrill, uh, MVFR conditions anticipated on Wednesday. And as we round up uh, through Rainy Pass, IFR conditions there in the morning giving way to MVFR. Same thing at Windy Pass there through the uh, Susitna Valley areas south of the south entrance, IFR in the morning giving way to MVFR conditions through Windy Pass on Wednesday. Isabel Pass, MVFR to start the day becoming VFR and generally VFR conditions should hold there further there in the eastern Alaska range at Mentasta Pass. South and west of there, Tanita Pass, MVFR, and Portage Pass should generally hold on to MVFR conditions during the day on Wednesday, but will be deteriorating Thursday and for Friday. Chilkoot and White, VFR should be the rule on Wednesday there in the northern panhandle. Quick check of freezing levels. They are lowest out over the bearing in association with that mid-upper level low colder pool of air aloft where freezing levels are below 4,000 feet. Otherwise, they bump upward to about 8,000 feet there near Haida Gwaii as well as the south end of the Panhandle and the interior generally between four and 6,000 feet. The greatest threat for icing will be that surge of moisture coming up with that atmospheric river uh, up through the North Pacific uh, on the Pacific side there of the Alaska Peninsula approaching south end of Kodiak Island above 9,000 feet due to the higher freezing levels falling off to 7,000 feet crossing there uh, the southeast bearing and then back toward the southwest coast YK deltas uh, just above uh, 5,000 feet. And strongest winds aloft, jet stream winds, uh, we have a wind max of 145 knots cutting across the eastern Aleutians into the uh, Alaska Peninsula from the southwest. On the backside, uh, winds turn out of the north, uh, upwards to 100 to 120 knots there across the far western Aleutian chain. Bringing it down to 9,000 feet, you can see uh, the surge there of stronger winds aloft, 65 knots there south of the Alaska Peninsula associated with uh, the low pressure system that will be uh, uh, dominant uh, as it uh, kind of just pivots there through the uh, southeastern bearing, sending all that moisture up through the western and northern areas of the Gulf. On Wednesday, look for uh, winds at 3,000 feet to be strongest from Kodiak Island uh, southward out over the North Pacific, upwards uh, 35 to 50 knots. The greatest threat of turbulence will be first an area there along the outer panhandle and southern panhandle area surface to 6,000 feet. As we go back toward the southwest surface to 5,000 feet and then the Alaska Peninsula and just southwest of Kodiak Island surface to 4,000 feet and then finally back out there through the central Aleutians we could see some moderate turbulence surface to 3,000 feet. So there's your flight weather if you're able to get in the air. Have a safe flight. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and today I'm privileged to introduce Dr. Uccellini, the director of the United States National Weather Service. Welcome back to Alaska, sir. Thank you, Dave. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, prior to be being the leader of the National Weather Service, uh, your work included an extensive look at snowstorms across the northeastern United States. 
And these are the types of storms that can bring some of the country's largest cities to its knees. Uh, tell me a little bit about your fascination with snow. Well, as far back as I can remember, I've, I've always been interested in, in weather, mm -hmm. uh, growing up as a, as a kid in, uh, on Long Island, New York, and was particularly fascinated by uh, snowstorms, um, why they occurred, the distribution of snow was very varied across the entire region, the rain snow line, all those things fascinated me right from the get-go. And um, I was interested in knowing how they worked, um, how the forecast worked, or more often than not, didn't work uh, uh, one way or the other. And that drove me, um, uh, that interest continued to build and um, drove me through high school right into college, uh, wanting to be a meteorologist. Oh, okay, that's a fascinating story, and I think every meteorologist has a weather story like that in some way. Right. Uh, due to Alaska's size and the proximity to the North Pole, sometimes it's difficult to detect and analyze the weather patterns over Alaska. Uh, what's the National Weather Service doing to improve that weather detection? Well, uh, observations uh, in this type of environment is, is a big challenge, uh, whether it's um, from space um, or uh, from what we call in-situ observations from the, from the ground or within the systems. Mm -hmm. Um, clearly, uh, satellites have been playing an increasing role in providing uh, the big picture, uh, not only from a visual sense and what you see is occurring, um, but also from providing the data for numerical models that then are used to actually predict the weather. Uh, Alaska is actually pretty well uh, positioned with respect to polar orbiting satellites since you get a, f um, a, a faster return of those satellites over your particular area. And in fact, the, uh, the polar satellite system is the backbone for the observations that we use in our models, uh, especially our global models, and they're particularly important uh, for observing weather features that affect Alaska. Alaskans live and die by the weather every day. And one of the strategic goals of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Weather Service is to develop a more weather-ready nation. What does it mean for Alaskans to be weather-ready? Well, these, the strategic outcome is based on uh, people being ready, responsive, and therefore resilient to uh, the increasing uh, threats to extreme weather events. Uh, those threats are related to um, not only the nature of the events, but the fact that we're becoming more vulnerable to them as we have more people, more infrastructure uh, that could be um, affected by these events. So we have to ensure that the observations we make for situational awareness, the forecast we make for people to take the proper responses um, are connected uh, to people's uh, actions, you know, the response to these events, so that uh, they will be more resilient uh, to um, uh, what's uh, facing them. Um, you know, there are examples with respect to hurricanes, uh, more people living along the coastline takes longer to evacuate. We have to make better forecasts with longer lead times, but we also have to communicate the threats so people will actually take action to avoid those storms. Up here you have, um, as in other parts of the United States, an increasing threat related to fire. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as there are more people living in fire-prone areas, um, we have to ensure that our forecasts are good, uh, that we don't have uh, false alarms that make people not react to uh, um, the forecast when, in fact, they should. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have to be able to communicate the threat to make sure that we're working with the partners in the emergency management community uh, so that um, communities uh, and right down to individuals will actually take the proper responses in the face of these events. So that's the strategic goal. There are a lot of challenges for us terms of improving forecasts, but also improving our communication skills and linking with the emergency management communities that are actually out there uh, trying to protect lives and mitigate property loss. So a huge partnership effort going forward. Uh, that's, that's one of the important keys for the success of uh, meeting the strategic goal. Okay. Well, one of the things you're talking about was uh, understanding the, the weather information we're getting back from the computers, weather modeling, and you did a lot of work with that in some of your prior, uh, prior positions with the Environmental Prediction Center there, the National Center for Environmental Prediction. Um, what can you tell us about recent improvements in that weather modeling? And you're using uh, the polar orbiters as kind of a, a source of information that started right. that process. Well, you know, first of all, we have to recognize that everything you see you read and hear about weather, climate, or ocean forecasts are all driven by numerical models. Now, mm -hmm. it, it really is 
been the, uh, the revolution in our forecast process uh, in the last part of, um, of the 20th century. Uh, the success of that numerical enterprise is based on three factors. Big computers, mm -hmm. um, po uh, global data, not just local data, but you have to have a global data set, and then the models themselves, the science that's behind the models and in running the models um, in an operational mode. So we're working to improve all three of those components. Uh, we um, upgraded our computers last year. We're, we're going through another upgrade right, even as I speak. Uh, we'll be upgrading from 200 trillion calculations per second to 700 trillion mm -hmm. calculations per second by January of 2015. Uh, this increase in the computer will allow us to run what we call Earth system models. It's not just the atmosphere, it's the atmosphere, ocean, mm -hmm. ice, which is obviously very important up here, and land models that are all coupled together okay. at higher resolution. So you need the big computers, you need the uh, science uh, that allows us to run these models and run them in a parallel mode and that they're coupled so that the ocean effects could affect the atmosphere and vice versa, mm -hmm. as an example. Uh, and then the global observations are absolutely critical and um, over the last 20, 30 years they've become more dependent upon the satellite systems um, and especially the uh, polar orbiting satellites which help drive the, uh, the observations needed for those models, whether they be atmospheric observations, land, ice observations. Um, we're driving more and more of that from satellites now that feed into these models and produce forecasts with extended lead times now, out, you know, for extreme events especially, we're, we're seeing a much improved forecast out in the four, five, six, seven, and even eight day range, which is, gets us back to Weather Ready Nation because if you're going to get ready for a storm event, you want those consistent forecasts approaching that event from day seven, six, five, four, three, mm -hmm. so you can take the actions several days in advance that can help mitigate the property loss and, and, and protect uh, your livelihood. Okay, all part of the mission of protecting life and property. Dr. Uccellini, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And speaking to Alaskans and sharing how the National Weather Service is working for Alaska and the nation. Wish you safe travels around the 49th. Enjoy your time here, sir. And for Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back and let's start out looking at the sea ice edge. One thing our ice desk reports and is forecasting that essentially the coastal navigable waters of Alaska are ice free and there's usually a small period of late summer beginning of early fall where this happens before the next season's ice begins to develop. Still some lingering ice along areas of the far northern Russian coast otherwise should be in the clear there. We'll take a further look here, but first let's uh, go into what the uh, marine forecast is calling for Wednesday across the southeast panhandle. Look for variable winds, inner channels around Petersburg, waves just a couple of feet. Uh, south, uh, look for uh, north uh, winds there, Lynn Canal, 20 knots, waves three to four feet, and northwesterly winds to 15 knots, catch a can down through Metlakotla with waves of five to six feet. Outer coast winds generally 20 to 25 knots south of Gustavus with waves of 7 to 11 feet there off of Craig. On Thursday, as the frontal system to the west uh, approaches, we expect inner channels winds will be a mixed bag. Uh, northwest 15 knots, waves 2 3 feet at Ketchikan. Southeast 20 knots, uh, middle channels around Petersburg with waves 3 to 4 feet, and south winds 20 knots and uh, waves running three to four feet in Lynn Canal. Uh, winds will generally be southwest to south along the outer coast at 15 to 20 knots, increasing to 30 knots west of Yakutat where waves will build in excess of 10 feet, 10 to 12 feet there. Across uh, the northwestern gulf, variable winds Prince William Sound on Wednesday at 10 knots, waves two feet. Variable winds 10 to 15 knots, mid and upper Cook Inlet with waves a couple of feet there. And winds will generally be out of the south, southeast to 20 knots at the entrance of Cook Inlet with waves four or five feet. By Thursday, frontal system working its way across the region will enhance winds. Uh, southeast winds 35 to 40 knot gales south of Cordova into Prince William Sound with waves of nine to 14 feet. Winds will be uh, south, southwest, 25 to 30 knots, entrance of Cook Inlet with waves of 9 to 12 feet, and generally south, southwest winds up the middle and upper uh, Cook Inlet with waves 5 to 6 feet. 
across uh, the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, winds will generally be out of the uh, south-southeast 25 to 30 knots on the North Pacific side with waves of 8 to 10 feet. On the Bering side, southeast winds 15 knots uh, in, for areas around Bristol Bay with waves a few feet. And then on Thursday, as low pressure uh, works its way uh, northward up to near uh, and north of Kuskokwim Bay, we expect uh, widespread areas of 30 to even 35 knot gales coming into Bristol Bay there, waves as high as 11 feet. North Pacific side waves running anywhere from 11 to in excess of 15 feet, especially east and southeast of Kodiak Island. On Wednesday for the Aleutian chain, central eastern Aleutians generally northwest to north winds uh, around 20 knots. Waves 6 to 7 feet to north Pacific side, 5 to 8 feet on the Bering side. And then for Thursday, winds will generally be out of the west across the central and eastern Aleutians at 25 to 30 knots. Waves generally right around 7 feet on the north Pacific side and 8 to 10 feet on the Bering side. Along the southwest coast and including St. Matthew down through the Pribilof Islands, variable winds 10 knots, waves generally around 4 feet in the vicinity of uh, Nunavik Island and 5 to as high as 8 feet near uh, St. Matthew. Look for southerly winds 10 knots there in Norton Sound with waves a couple of feet. As low pressure works its way there along the southwest coast between the uh, Kuskokwim and lower Yukon deltas, we see winds uh, turning westerly 25 to 30 knots south of Nunavik Island with waves of 5 to as high as 11 feet. Northeast to north winds coming out of uh, Norton Sound at 25 to 20 knots uh, with waves uh, 5 feet or so there and south of St. Lawrence Island. Across the Arctic coast, winds will be out of the east 10 knots, waves 2-3 feet. Those winds will turn more northerly through the lower Chukchi Sea, picking up to 15-20 to 20 knots through the Bering Strait with waves of 4-5 to five feet. On Thursday, winds will be easterly to 15 knots along the Arctic coast, waves there running a few feet, turning northeasterly through the Bering Strait, and then uh, northerly and increasing to 20 knots, waves running 2-3 to three feet in the lower Chukchi Sea, and as much as 4-5 to five feet on the north side of St. Lawrence Island. Quick check of the weather maps. Wednesday afternoon low pressure will be crossing uh, the lower half of the Alaska Peninsula as a surge of moisture rides northeastward ahead of it into the western Gulf and for Thursday that low will sit along the southwestern coast with a frontal system working eastward with heavy rainfall across the areas surrounding Prince William Sound. That does it for the show tonight. Thank you for watching. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.